Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Mishu. Today, we have the opportunity of sitting down with Dr. Ivatova Hiroshima and Dr. Rawad Reyes to talk about their August Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice article on pediatric firearm injuries to the extremity and the management of those injuries in the emergency department. It's a critically important issue, and we're going to cover a lot of information. So I hope you enjoy the thorough review. In the meantime, I don't want you to forget that epmedicine.net remains your source for all of your continuing medical education needs. That's monthly articles published for adults, for pediatrics, and for urgent care medicine, all evidence-based, all with four hours of CME per issue, all available to you in the mobile app, and also available to you at ebmedicine.net. And now, without any further ado, let's get to that discussion. Hi, I'm Eva Tobar Hiroshima. I am affiliated to the University of California at Riverside. I work at Riverside, and I also work in Tijuana, Mexico as the EMS Medical Director. And then I am Rawad Reyes. I am also an emergency medicine physician, though I'm still in residency at Riverside. And then we'll be shortly on our way to Milwaukee for a quick care fellowship as well. Thank you both for being on the program. You guys are two of the three authors for the Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice article in August on firearm injuries. In fact, pediatric firearm injuries to the extremity why this topic? Does one of you have a particular interest in firearm injuries, or is this something you just happen to see a lot in your practice where you are, or how did you stumble on this topic? I would say, yeah, definitely something we see pretty frequently in our trauma bay. We have a bubble one trauma center. And like any good doctors, wanted to optimize our resuscitation skills. And I think one of the best ways to do that is with a thorough lit review. What I would add for is that working in a trauma at level one center, we get to see the toll that both patients as well as families experience after our arm injury and as well as the effect that it has on the health uh, team that uh, is taking care of the patient. So that is a driver to delve into this topic. And then in addition to that, I think that in Tijuana, there we see a, a lot of gunshot wounds. And so being able to understand a little bit more about the evidence-based medicine in order to develop protocols that are evidence-based is, was an important factor for me. Excellent. Well, I'm very happy personally that you two chose this topic because I found it to be exceptionally helpful. When we're talking about pediatric firearm injuries, how common is that in the emergency department for us to see? Do we have data on that? Yeah, so... I, the specific numbers vary depending on how you phrase the question and which database you check into, but it's in the tens of thousands, usually in the 20 to 40,000 range as far as injuries go. Fatalities are lower, so they're not incredibly common. Kids are thankfully pretty healthy and resilient, but despite the sheer numbers not being incredibly high, it is still a leading cause of death in pediatric patients, usually the second or third leading cause of death, depending on, again, how you phrase the question, which data bank you query. And because of that, it makes it a pretty ripe target for public health interventions and where we can have some pretty effective changes to decrease morbidity and mortality. When you say that the numbers are increasing, so we're talking about pediatric patients who are victims of firearm injuries in the U.S., those numbers nationally are increasing here annually over the last few years? Yeah, I mean, so we mostly looked at over the last 10 years, and it's definitely been a pretty significant uptrend. Some sources we had showed almost like a 25% increase in fatalities over that time period. And actually in 2019, it's become the main cause of pediatric death. Um, before it was motor vehicle collisions, and since 2019, it's now the first cause of death in pediatric patients. Wow. And when we talk about pediatric patients with firearm injuries, is there a portion of the body that's the most frequent location for these types of injuries? Yeah, the data changes depending on which age group you kind of focus on, which demographic, but in general, extremities are the most common location 
for these types of injuries, though thankfully they tend to be the least fatal. And when we talk about firearm injuries in children, is there information that we can gather from the national data about the circumstances under which these are occurring? Is it usually accidental? Is it mostly intentional? Do we have an idea of how these are occurring? In regards to fatality, head injuries tend to be the most fatal, except in older teenagers, like over the age of 15, in which case injuries to the chest or torso in general tend to be more fatal. And that tends to reflect the underlying intent or etiology of these injuries. So in younger patients, it tends to be more accidental discharges, whereas in older patients, it tends to be more interpersonal violence, homicide, legal intervention, those types of things. Mm. And from a public health perspective, that's super important to have information on so that you can design effective interventions, right? Your intervention is going to be more effective if you target it towards a specific population. And so what we know from the CDC data is that these are occurring mostly accidentally? So basically, you can see some disparities as well as, as Rod was alluding to, it changes depending on the age. So usually younger patients who are white will be the victims of accidental trauma, while older patients who are either Black or Hispanic will be victims of interpersonal violence. And understanding these differences is important because as Rod was saying, you can target specific strategies. And so I understand that as emergency physicians, we're not all policymakers, but there are certain things that we can do in a day-to-day basis that can affect the lives of the patients that we treat. So understanding who is at risk and for what type of firearm injury is important in order for us to be able to discuss, for example, safe storage practices, or to screen for mental and health issues, or to see what resources we have in the communities that we serve, such as hospital-based intervention programs where there are wraparound services that can provide case management to at-risk youth. And this is, these are simple strategies that we can do today and that can save lives. When we're talking about firearm injuries, there is a whole set of terminology that comes along with that discussion. I thought the table on page four of the article actually was very, very helpful. It's a list of types of firearms, types of ammunition, firearm settings and modifications and a description of each of them to help inform us about how to better have that conversation. And also, there is a relevance to the injury patterns depending on the weapon used. Is that right? Definitely. Yeah. So the terms are useful to be aware of, both for you know communication with EMS and law enforcement during the actual event on the front lines. But then furthermore, I think this is an inherently polarizing topic. And so if we're going to have a civil conversation about it, advocate for any kind of public health intervention or just generally speak for any kind of position of expertise or authority, we should also know the correct terminology and use it appropriately. And when it comes to the mechanisms of damage, so beyond just the weapon itself, there is a difference in the type of ammunition. There's a a good description in the article about the different flight patterns of projectiles, yawning, tumbling, recession, all of these mechanisms that impact the type of injury that the patient is going to experience. Is that something that is helpful to know in the background? Does it have a bearing, you think, clinically when we're at the bedside trying to treat a patient? How do we take that little piece of information and apply it to our bedside treatment of a patient? So it's of limited utility in actually treating the patient in front of you. At the end of the day, the the information you have on the weapon or the ammunition is not going to be 100% reliable. So you treat the patient in front of you, you treat the wound in front of you, not the weapon that was used. That being said, I think we've all been in a position where we see something in the trauma bay and we're not really sure how this happened or that doesn't quite make sense with the reported mechanism. And so being aware of the different types of forces that these projectiles are under, how they possibly fragment, how they actually cause tissue damage can at least help alleviate some of the confusion and kind of explain some of the injury patterns you see, even if it's not necessarily going to change your actual management of the wound in front of you. And then furthermore, it also brings into clarity the differences between different types of weapons 
and why one is so much more devastating than the other. Um, that being rifles and other high powered and firearms as opposed to handguns. Yeah, those are great points, especially when we're looking at something that doesn't clinically make sense with the story that we're receiving. I could see that being very helpful in that scenario. When we're talking about pre-hospital care, you mentioned EMS and the information they give us. What kinds of things are we asking our EMS personnel that would be helpful to us clinically when we're trying to address a patient and their injuries? What kinds of information can they give us? I think asking about the type of bleeding, if it was pulsatile versus non-pulsatile bleeding, asking about the use of tourniquets. If they did apply one, then it's also important to figure out what time or when it was applied. The estimated blood loss can also be useful. And then in addition to that, understanding a little bit more the circumstances that the injury occurred. So if, especially if we're dealing with infants or children, figuring out if the shooter is someone who is known by the child would be important in order to either call CPS if there's other siblings or other children involved. So that, that would definitely be important for us to investigate further. I'm curious, in your own clinical setting, how often do you think you're seeing firearm injuries coming by EMS versus just arriving by private vehicle? Do you have any sense of that? I would say that it depends on the age. So infants and children usually will come by ambulance. And then older patients or victims of interpersonal violence may come, yeah, drop off. Hmm. So when the patient presents to us in the emergency department, the pediatric patient especially, and EMS gives us that history, and now it's time for our evaluation in the emergency department, there was some discussion in the article about the pediatric age-adjusted shock index. Tell me what that is exactly and, and how that's helpful to apply to our practice. So the age-adjusted shock index is basically a measure that can be helpful at the bedside. And it's the heart rate divided by the systolic blood pressure of the child. And what it can help us determine is if that patient requires further resuscitation or if that patient requires interventions or surgical interventions. So we can't use it as a single data point. That's something to remember. But it is something that if we trend, similar to, for example, the vena cava in point of care ultrasound. Uh, so if we trend this value and we see that it's worsening, it just alerts us that the patient is being under resuscitated or, or may require further interventions. And so one thing to remember is that infant and children have a fixed stroke volume. And so what they do is that they increase their heart rate. And so because the age-adjusted stock index does take into account heart rate, it can help us determine if the patient is in compensation shock. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Let's spend a little bit more time on that for a second. So if I'm treating an adult patient who is the victim of a firearm injury and they're in shock, I'm accustomed to seeing hypotension and tachycardia. But that interesting little point you just brought up in, in children, especially the younger children, that isn't the case. The hypotension is a very, very late finding. Is that right? Correct. So hypotension is a late and ominous finding. If you're seeing hypotension, you're late in the game and you have under-resuscitated your patient. So you have to be aware of persistent tachycardia. And you also, another physical finding that is useful is also delayed capillary refill, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's a progression. So tachycardia to delayed capillary refill, and then finally hypotension. And at that point, you're having a difficult time resuscitating the child because you're way behind the ball. That is correct. So hypotension will occur once there's 30 to 40% of blood loss. Delayed capillary refill will, will occur around 15 to 30% of blood loss. So it's an earlier finding than, than hypotension. Yeah, this is a pretty important point just because there's, in a lot of the questions we had in writing up this paper, there's not that much data. And so a lot of the pediatric data is from expert opinion or extrapolated from the adult literature. But this was one point where the data was crystal clear. There is no permissive hypotension in children. Hypotension is late stage ominous finding, whereas in adults, you know, we're used to the concept of permissive hypotension. 
Yeah, that's another good point. So if you're listening and you're not familiar with that term, permissive hypotension is saying it's okay for an adult to have a lower than usual blood pressure in a traumatic setting as we're resuscitating them as long as they're mentating well and otherwise responding to resuscitation. That doesn't exist in the pediatric literature because hypotension is a very late finding and a sign of severe shock at that point. So that's an excellent point. When it comes to hemorrhage control, there's been a lot of focus recently on tourniquet placement, and there are some excellent pictures in the article on how to place tourniquets. There is a discussion about extremities versus these junctional wounds. Tell me what that is exactly and how we combat that in the emergency department. So junctional wounds are injuries that involve the junction regions. So that means the areas between the extremity and the trunk. So this would be either the axilla or the inguinal region. And the problem with these is that you've got vascular or major vascular vessels running through them. However, hemorrhage control is a little more difficult because you can't place a tourniquet, for example. Mm. The way you would treat these junctional injuries are with direct pressure, or you can sometimes pack them. And then more recently, there's been these deployable hemostatic sponges that are not ready for prime use, but seem to be promising to temporarily control bleeding in these regions. And these are sponges that are placed in a syringe or, or deployed into a cavity of some sort into that area where you can't reach to put pressure. That is correct. Yes. So definitely some exciting stuff on the horizon. A lot of that work was pioneered in the military medicine literature, and then it's slowly making its way into pre-hospital care. So yeah, one of the things to look out for in the future is to continue to optimize it. When we talk about our primary survey, we think of the primary survey as airway breathing and circulation, but it's very, very important to apply that tourniquet, put that pressure on there, or do something to stop the hemorrhage control as you progress through your initial assessment. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And I think that we've gone a step further with the Stop the Bleed campaign, for example. And so now we're not waiting for the EMS provider or the EM doctor to stop the bleed. We're actually empowering and teaching public to do this before they arrive to our emergency departments or before the ambulance gets there. I think that's a brilliant move. It's probably one of the most important things we can really stress for people is that the data shows that hemorrhagic shock or hemorrhage is still the leading cause of death in these patients. So whatever you can do to get proximal control earlier, apply direct pressure, just decrease the volume loss is going to be where we get the biggest bang for our buck in improving outcomes. Good. And I'll restate that. So if you're listening and you happen to be in such a disaster scenario where you're the first bystander present, then putting pressure on a bleeding wound to stop the hemorrhage is a critical step and oftentimes the most necessary step until more help arrives. But then this is also important for EMS, also important for us. You know, Many times we see people attempt hemorrhage control with soft padded dressings or dressings that just saturate blood, but we're talking here about tourniquets. We're talking about applying pressure directly to bleeding vessels and doing things that are far better at controlling bleeding than just taking a padded gauze and shoving it on a place that's bleeding. When we talk about our secondary survey, so if we've obtained hemorrhage control and we hopefully aren't dealing with a junctional wound and we are getting ready to move on to our secondary survey, what kinds of things become important to consider at this stage? On the secondary survey, generally you do the regular head-to-toe exam, right? And you start with a focus history while you're getting all this. You want to make sure your patient's not going to get a medicine they're allergic to. You want to know what medications they're on to see if it could be affecting some aspect of their resuscitation, past medical history, last meal, and then events surrounding injury. So that's your ample mnemonic. And then get more information on what type of bleeding was it, as Dr. Tober mentioned, was it pulsatile? Was it kind of a slow trickling bleed? How much blood was expected to have been lost on scene? So getting this history while you're doing your head-to-toe exam, the head-to-toe exam in general is, is pretty straightforward and not too different from what you do in an adult. I would say just always make sure to check underneath the seat collar and make sure you're not missing an injury under there. And then the next, the only specific consideration I would have here would be to document everything objectively and clearly in medical terms, 
if you have the ability to take pictures and put those in your EMR, a lot of this is going to be used later for evidence or it could be potentially used in trial in some way, shape or form. So avoid conjecture and stick to objective terms. In this discussion, there was a paragraph about some of the hard and soft signs of vascular injury. Tell me about that distinction and why that becomes important for us during resuscitation. Yeah, so hard signs are basically if you see a postal external bleeding, if there's an expanding hematoma, if there's a thrill or brewery, if, if the limb is pulseless, if there is pallor, if there is a neurological de deficit. And the importance of understanding and, and knowing hard vascular signs of trauma is that these would prompt you to think of surgical or emergent surgical management. Now, the soft signs of vascular injury are a history of arterial bleed that is not pulsatile, wounds that are close to major vessels, and small non pulsatile hematomas. In these cases, you wouldn't necessarily jump to send that patient to the OR, but you would have a higher suspicion for possible vascular injury, and thinking about advanced imaging may be prudent. Excellent. And if we are dealing with someone with hard signs of vascular injury, that person is getting immediate consultation with our trauma or vascular surgeons and being taken to the operating room for repair? Correct. And what about the person with the soft signs? How does the algorithm change for us in that sort of scenario? So that would depend on where you are and what other injuries the patient has, right? So if the patient is hemodynamically stable and you are in a pediatric trauma center, considering getting advanced imaging such as a CTA or CT angio is probably the next step. However, if you are in a setting where you don't have definitive care and you are gonna send that patient to a referral center or to a pediatric trauma center, then I would recommend holding off on advanced imaging, and then just making sure or expediting transfer to the appropriate hospital. Perfect. If we happen to be at a tertiary care center and the patient's arriving to us and we're looking at someone with some of the soft signs of vascular injury, there is discussion in the article about the arterial pressure index and the use of that in the algorithm. Tell me what that measurement is and how that can help us when we're talking about diagnostic studies. Sure. So the arterial pressure index or Doppler pressure index it has, or injured extremity index, they're all very similar and generally analogous to the ankle brachial index, which is validated for peripheral arterial disease. So this is just a, a variation of it that's been validated in trauma generally involves taking the systolic blood pressure in the injured extremity and then comparing it to the uninjured upper extremity. And then any value over 0.9 would be reassuring, whereas a value under 0.9 would be concerning that there is some type of concerning vascular injury and the patient should definitively get confirmatory diagnostic imaging. Whereas if you are using more physical exam skills. And these are pediatric patients who we like to avoid irradiating as much as possible. This might be able to save you a few scans. Good. So if that index is less than 0.9, you said then that's an indicator that you need to pursue this further with some more diagnostic imaging. But if it's above, then hopefully the rest of the exam is equally as reassuring. And then perhaps you can bypass some of that radiation. Now, we've talked a lot about vascular injury specifically, but on page five, table two, there's a list of the differential diagnosis for firearm injuries to the extremity. There's a whole lot of other types of injuries that can accompany firearm injuries. Tell me about what other kinds of things we should keep in our differential other than the obvious vascular and hemorrhage control. I think that when you're assessing a patient in the bay, there are two things that you need to distinguish. So the first one is, is this a peripheral vascular injury or is this a junctional injury? That's important because junctional injuries are much harder to control and um, they have a higher propensity of death, right? So being able to identify that is important. And then the second thing, which we kind of alluded to was, does a patient have any hard signs of vascular injury? Because those would require emergent treatment. The other injuries that you'll face, such as open fractures, unstable fractures, joint involvement, 
are things that you definitely should consider, but you have a little more time. They're not as emergent. They're not as threatening as the other two injuries that I was talking about. But these are important things to consider. In addition, metabolic disarray secondary to vascular injuries, such as rhabdo, compartment syndrome, are also diagnoses that we need to consider in patients with gunshot injuries. Perfect. And then if we finished our secondary survey and we're getting ready to move on to diagnostics, we enjoy ordering lots of tests in the emergency department. Let's start with labs. Is there anything specific on labs that we need or should be obtaining other than just routine screening? Or is even that necessary in a typical pediatric trauma patient? So hemorrhagic shock is the main cause of death in these patients. So the hemoglobin is not going to change your management, right? So I would say it's mainly clinical judgment. But if you have time, sending a type and cross match would be helpful. In addition to the rest of your typical trauma labs, CBC, BMP, LFTs, if you have the capacity for TEG, that would also be useful. Yeah, the lags are obviously of less utility in the acute resuscitation because they take a while to come back, but they are definitely something our colleagues upstairs are going to use in judging how this patient has been adequately resuscitated. So the trend is important over time, even if it's not going to be directly relevant to the provider in the initial encounter. Good. And then for imaging, is there a role for plain film x-ray imaging? Is that helpful? Yeah, so definitely plain films would be great for checking for retained foreign bodies, which is a important thing to make sure you don't miss. Obviously, you can assess for fractures, and notably any fracture in the context of a gunshot wound is an open fracture and should have an orthopedic consultation. And then on the topic of our orthopedic colleagues, we know that they like having their plain films, <laughs> regardless of whether or not you have other advanced imaging. And then when it comes to CT imaging, we've talked about CT angiography as an option for those with soft signs of vascular injury. That's still helpful, even if they don't have vascular injury. Are we still screening people with CT to, to look at bullet trajectories or other organ involvement, or is that helpful? If you're concerned about concomitant injuries to the abdomen or chest, then of course, you know, get a CAT scan of these regions. But that said, if you're not concerned about vascular injury, then getting a CT of the extremity wouldn't necessarily be something I would recommend. Yeah, the only context I could imagine doing something like that was if it was like a very specific type of open fracture that an orthopedist needed to take to the operating room. Perfect. There is a section in the article also about damage control resuscitation. So tell me what that specifically is referring to as opposed to just our routine emergency department resuscitations. So as we had talked about, permissive hypotension is something that we shouldn't be doing in pediatric patients. So the other aspect of damage control, in addition to permissive hypotension, that is something that we see in adults, would be MTP or massive transfusion protocols. And so this is somewhat controversial still. So in the UK and Europe, TXA is being used in pediatric trauma centers. However, this is not something that is widely used in the U.S., The TikTok trial was a trial that recently published its results. Unfortunately, it wasn't powered to look at clinical outcomes. So we still have to wonder. What I would say is if you have a patient who is a pediatric patient who has a firearm injury, who comes in within three hours of the injury, who has penetrating trauma to the chest, the neck, the abdomen or pelvis, and has signs of shock either compensated or uncompensated, or if you have suspicion for persistent or ongoing bleeding, then considering TXA is prudent. There are different doses. The most typical dose would be 50 mg per kilogram as a bolus, followed by a 2 mg per kg per hour infusion run in eight hours. Good. And Also under damage control was the tourniquet, not just placement, but then what you're supposed to do about it after it's been applied. So when we talk about tourniquets that perhaps were applied at the scene or by EMS, how long is it appropriate for those things to stay in place? And what kind of monitoring are we supposed to be providing for the patient while they have the tourniquet on? So we had to extrapolate from the adult literature because there's not 
much in the pediatric literature. So according to the adult literature, you need to remove that tourniquet within 120 minutes of applying the tourniquet. Now, there are certain things that you should understand before you decide to take that tourniquet down. And the main issues are understanding what are the contraindications to remove the tourniquet. So basically, these are, if there is a traumatic amputation distal to the tourniquet, you wouldn't want to remove that, obviously. If the patient has hemodynamic instability, if there are other life-threatening injuries, or if you work in a place where you are unable to monitor closely for re-bleeding, you shouldn't be taking down that tourniquet. Now, that said, if no contraindications exist and you decide to take off that tourniquet, you would need to make sure that there is no re-bleeding and you want to watch that limb for at least an hour or so. If there is re-bleeding, then you may apply some chemostatic gauze. And if that doesn't work, you may have to consider reapplying that tourniquet. Now, if that tourniquet has been in place for more than 120 minutes, then there's certain complications that you need to be aware of. So that would be reperfusion injury. And that basically means that there is this massive influx of electrolytes, basically potassium, that run into that bloodstream as soon as you take off that tourniquet, and that can lead to lethal arrhythmias. But because of this, if that tourniquet has been placed for more than 10 to 20 minutes, the recommendation is for that patient to be monitored in a critical care setting. So that means intensive care unit level of monitoring in that patient? It means that, well, sometimes our emergency departments serve or work uh, as a critical care setting, right? So as long as that patient is monitored and there's a nurse that can assess that patient frequently, the emergency department will be or can be an appropriate place to, to remove that tourniquet. Gotcha. When we're talking about monitoring, we're talking about continuous cardiac monitoring. So this person needs to be on a cardiac monitor with someone actually watching the output of the monitor. Correct. No waiting room allowed. That's right. I'd be much more comfortable trying to remove a tourniquet that's been on for an extended period of time if I'm in our level one trauma center or pediatric specialty center than I would if I'm in rural hospital, single coverage kind of picture, right? So not all EDs are built different and it's uh, going to be up to you to use your clinical judgment to figure out what's best for your patient in the moment. Yeah, so that, that brings up a good point. So if you're working in a rural setting and you've got someone with a tourniquet in place and it hasn't been 120 minutes, then it's okay to take that down, look for re-bleeding, talk about hemostatic dressings, and look at the extremity to see what happens after you take it down. But if it's already been more than 120 minutes and you're in a rural setting, now you're kind of in this gray zone where it just depends on the clinical scenario, your comfort level, how much monitoring you have, and lots of other things that go into that decision before you just automatically take that thing down. At the end of the day, you want to salvage whatever limb you can, just not at the cost of a life either. So generally, they they actually be to fit within that 120-minute timeline. A lot of the trauma sources recommended trying to get the initial visit done within the first 90 minutes and then have 30 minutes to transfer to definitive care at another center. So time is of the essence, especially if you're not at the final uh, disposition. Absolutely. All right, let's talk about some of the wounds. So when we talk about gunshot wounds, there are some people who think, well, these are hot projectiles being fired and they should be clean and sterile. So what's the big deal with a gunshot wound? If we just do some local wound care, do they really need antibiotic coverage? Is there any good data on that? Yeah, so the data on antibiotic coverage is generally mixed, but there, I lean towards recommending antibiotics. And you definitely don't need to give prolonged antibiotic to everyone, but a single dose of a second or third generation cephalosporin should generally do the trick. That's also a pretty commonly heard myth, I guess, is that, you know, bullets are high energy and high heat and sterilized by the, the ballistic processes that they go through. And that's unfortunately not true. And then furthermore, it's not just the bullet you have to worry about either. You have retained pieces of clothing, or in the case of blast injuries or other kind of penetrating projectiles, can even have soil or other contaminants also mixed in there. Good. And there's a, another excellent table. This is page 13, table six, which talks about the duration of antibiotic coverage. So depending on how much contamination we think has occurred, that antibiotic coverage is being drawn out for two to three days, potentially, 
depending on what the wound looks like. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Simple wounds, single dose, like we talked about, more contaminated. I do not hesitate to cover further, provided that this patient's not getting admitted for some other surgical intervention. And if they happen to have a fracture, you mentioned earlier that these are treated like open fractures. So that's a whole nother course of antibiotics that's required just for that particular treatment as well. Yeah. So in these patients, you know, a broken bone is an open fracture. Joint involvement is going to be a septic joint. They don't get it washed out. And then one other thing to consider in those ones is that if you do have a bullet that gets retained in the joint, definitely then case reports. Kind of surprising number of case reports actually of uh, lead poisoning as the snow wheel fluid slowly dissolves away the bullet. Let's talk about that specific scenario for just a second. So joint involvement with a projectile, so a bullet that's retained in a joint is distinctly different than a bullet in a wound. Tell me about both of those scenarios. Let's start with just bullet in a wound. Is it necessary to pull that out? Do we have to go fishing for these things or is it safe to just leave them in there? Yeah, no, it's generally pretty safe to leave them in there. Definitely seen some interesting cases in adults where they come in as a retained bullet is slowly working its way out of the skin and it's now on the surface. So interesting stuff there. You don't need to remove bullets necessarily, but if they are causing symptoms in the long term can be removed. In the short term, the major consideration would be, is it next to some sensitive neurovascular bundle or other sensitive structure? that could potentially be damaged as the bullet migrates out over the next several months or years. And then on the other side of the spectrum, if the projectile is in a joint, how does that change? Right. So in that one, that joint's going to need a washout. The capsule is violated. And then this is more of the historical data, having the lead bullets that dissolve in the synovial fluid, which can also happen with soft tissue injuries, but is generally less common. The lead poisoning issue is actually pretty uncommon, even with retained bullets. Just that is one of the few scenarios where you still see lead poisoning come up pretty frequently in the literature. Yeah, so you're talking about a lead projectile being retained in the joint and then the synovial surface kind of starting to absorb some of that lead and causing symptoms for someone who, who still has that that foreign body left in their joint. If it is not just in the joint, it can also cause a systemic effect as well. Yep. And so if we are treating a pediatric patient who's got a bullet in a joint, that's another indication for emergent trauma or orthopedic consultation to, to get that joint washed out, but also to get that foreign body removed. Correct. The lead poisoning would be more of a unexplained behavior and development of symptoms over the course of the next several months and years, which unfortunately it takes a long time to figure out what's the underlying cause because it's so unusual. Good. And then when we talk about compartment syndrome, it, that can be a difficult diagnosis to make in younger children. How could we adjust our exam to try and accommodate for a patient's age in that kind of scenario? Yeah. So the classical teaching is obviously the P's of compartment syndrome with your pulse sensitiveness, pain out of proportion, your poiochiothermia, and all those other fun words. And yeah, in children, unfortunately, these findings are not quite as sensitive. In some cases, children are nonverbal. And so some of the orthopedic literature we found advocated for the A's of compartment syndrome as opposed to the P's should be like increasing anxiety and agitation and algesic requirements. These are important to be aware of in pediatric trauma. You don't want to miss it if it's happening from the initial injury. You don't want to cause it with a tourniquet wound or a splint that's too tight. And another point that is a little bit interesting with these is children tend to have a delayed presentation of compartment syndrome when compared to adults. There's some literature that showed that the mean time of diagnosis was about 23 hours or so, 24 hours. I don't remember the exact number with the mean time to fasciotomy approximately an hour longer than that. But the kids tended to have better outcomes than their adult counterparts, even with delayed fasciotomy. So advocate for your patients. If your surgeon's on the fence, obviously the final decision's up to them. But I would push them towards intervening because this child is more likely to have a positive outcome than the adult literature would suggest. Hmm. Interesting. I wonder if that delayed surgical intervention is due to delayed recognition, you think, or is it actually a delayed presentation? Do we, do we know? 
So I don't have a specific anatomical or physiological answer for you, at least not one that's database. <laughs> sure. But yeah, the study in question is talking about delayed recognition. So they didn't specify whether the child was discharged after the initial encounter or not. They were ambiguous about it in the initial study, yeah. unfortunately. All right, let's talk about rhabdomyolysis. So when we're talking about muscle injury, are there specific kinds of muscular wounds or firearm extremity injuries that we need to keep in mind that are more prone to this kind of complication? In general, the risk of this type of injury is related to the size of the muscle involved and the extent of the trauma. So obviously more severe injuries are at higher risk. So I might be a little bit more suspicious of it if it was a high powered firearm, like a rifle, or if a patient had prolonged tourniquet application for reaching definitive care. But yeah, typically the patients that get this are young, healthy males with lower extremity injuries or multiple extremity injuries are the going to be your highest risk demographic on this one. But again, you always treat the patient in front of you. Let's talk about some of the items in the controversy section. So there's a good discussion there of hard and the soft signs that we just finished speaking about and CT and geography. What is the controversy now in this current day about looking for those signs and obtaining CT and geography? So again, we're extrapolating from the adult literature, but in the adult literature, what they're recommending is moving away from the hard versus soft sign and rather talking about either injuries that lead to hemorrhagic signs or injuries that lead to ischemic signs. And the other thing that, that they're also suggesting is just getting a CTA in all of your patients. And again, I think that this is uh, a difference between the adult trauma surgeons versus the pediatric trauma surgeons. The adult trauma surgeons have much lower threshold for radiation. So this section, is it's just important to, to emphasize that it's extrapolation from the adult literature. So the specifics in the pediatric population is still unknown. And then... We talked a little bit about this earlier, but there are some newer hemostatic dressings and devices that are coming down the pipeline that may be available to us at some point in emergency departments. And these things, you mentioned one already was the injectable sponge as a hemostatic control device for junctional wounds. Are there others? So the one that, that we talk about in the article is something called the XSTAT, which are hemostatic sponges that can be injected into either a junctional wound or a wound with a narrow entry point. And what they are, they're basically sponges that as they contact blood will simply soak all that blood. And these sponges can remain in place for around four hours. And according to a small study, there were only had 10 patients, but in that study, the XSTAT was able to control the bleeding in 90% of the cases. So it's mm. pretty promising. The authors of that article also describe that it's lightweight, that it's easy to use. So these are things that also help us with feasibility. It seems that it's a feasible instrument that we could use not only in the emergency department, but also in the back of an ambulance, for example. Yeah, specifically for our pre-hospital personnel, this would alleviate someone having to maintain continuous pressure on a wound and then address other things. This is something that would then need to be removed, I assume, at some point in the operating room? That is correct. The sponges need to be removed. And actually, one of the contra contraindications is retained sponges. So you definitely need to send that patient to the OR and the sponges need to come out. Good. And then Really, no discussion of pediatric firearms injuries would be complete if we didn't mention that there are jurisdictional laws about reporting. So most uh, jurisdictions have mandatory reporting laws for healthcare providers. So if you're treating someone with this kind of injury, that just needs to be reported, not necessarily by the physician. A staff member in the emergency department could do it, but you should know your local laws around re reporting, especially in children, for these kinds of injuries. That's correct. And something that is important to remember is that the police and CPS don't share databases. And so mm -hmm. mandatory reporting to the police does not necessarily mean that CPS will be informed. So if we are concerned about 
the well-being of the child, we also need to report to CPS. Mm, that's an excellent point. So child protective services and law enforcement, if you have concerns for not just reporting the injury, but also for the safety of the pediatric patient you're treating. That's an excellent point. Well, once again, we've reached the end, everyone. That is a wrap for this episode. I sincerely hope you enjoyed learning all this information. And thanks again to Dr. Ivatova Harashima and Dr. Reyes for their contributions and for authoring the article. Please rate us in whatever podcast store you are listening. As always, don't forget about ebmedicine.net and the EB Medicine mobile app and all the resources available to you as a subscriber. And if you're not a subscriber, consider joining now. It's a great time. So much information available to you at the point of care, on your mobile device, or on the website. Until next time, everyone, I'm your host, Sam Ashu. Be safe.